Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, the invitation to the RSD organisers, uh, to the SDA, to Cheryl in particular, for, for tireless work. Um, and congratulations, actually, on um, I think what's clearly going to be remembered as a exceptional event bringing together all kinds of different voices. I've heard quite a few bits of contributions over the last week, and I look forward to catching up. Uh, and thanks again so much for that uh, introduction, which which um, frames this perfectly. I should share my screen. As ever, hides the one I want. There it is. Okay, that's that's coming through okay by the looks of it. Um, okay, I should also note that this research uh, has been supported by a joint AHRC DFG research grant running from this year, 2023 to 25, entitled Enacting Gregory Bateson's Ecological Aesthetics. I'm indebted actually to all the co-investigators, the two PIs, Ben Sweeting and Dolmini Pereira, uh, co eyes Joanna Boner, Maria Davidova, Simon Sadler, and our two PhD researchers, Claudia Valverde and Stephanie uh, Hutthofer, for our various dialogues and workshops over this last year in Weimar, in Brighton, at the Bateson Archive at UC Santa Cruz. And I'm looking forward to hosting our forthcoming meeting at the Royal College of Art, where I'm based in November. Um, I'm based in the Environmental Architecture uh, Programme there. And I also have a uh, small research practice uh, largely based in, in Athens in Greece. I've actually, uh, in, the, in the last year or two, relinquished the roles I have at the Westminster and the Bartlett. So it's, it's uh, the RCA and, and real independence uh, these days. And maybe actually next year, one of those might be um, a hub in, in, you know, seems to be an incredibly healthy community here. Okay, so I read Gregory Bateson today. Born in 1904, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, he is a fascinating and colorful historical character. Of course, he was ahead of his time in all kinds of ways, in thinking about ecological systems, in anticipating biosemiotics. His thesis around the distribution of mind, as he nearly called his final monograph, anticipated by half a century what the contemporary cognitive sciences describe today as the four E's, embodied, embedded, enacted, and extended. His ability to find models of ecological wisdom within the traditional practices and cosmologies of multiple non-Western and historical cultures from both near and distant places and times, when combined with his relentless critiques of what he saw as the fundamental problems of Western thought, what he described as the epistemological error was amplified through Western thought, continued to resonate with much contemporary ecological feminist and indigenous studies research. And as my colleague Dalmini Pereira in, in the Ecological Aesthetics Research Project argues, you can argue that, that Bateson in many ways, he's not a decolonial thinker, but he prefigures a great deal and is a, is a, is a step on that, on that road. And beyond that, perhaps there's a simple historiographic interest just because there's always been a great problem in incorporating Bateson into our mainstream political uh, intellectual histories. Because he was actually intellectually critical of so many of our central concept leaders and intellectual patriarchs. He was critical of Freud, whose borrowing of the language of physics, using forces, urges, drives, etc., to describe psychological semiotic material. Bateson thought was not just bad metaphors, but potentially dangerous. He was critical of Marx. I mean, he did actually, he was repeatedly affirmative of Marx's contribution in the history of systems theory, but in various places pulled Marx up for what essentially he saw as errors in logical typing. I remember one location where he pulls him up for not being rigorous in differentiating individual workers and the class of workers. But perhaps most of all, he's critical of Darwin, who he thought had chosen completely the wrong unit of evolution, 
which for Bateson is not even simply the organism plus environment relation, which he often critiqued darling, Darwin with, sort of saying, well, at least that would be better than focusing on the organism. But even more fundamentally for Bateson, the deeper units of evolution are at one end of the scale, any organized patterns of matter, which in some sense for him are embodied ideas. And at the other end of the scale is the entire planetary ecology. In fact, I think Bateson's goal, his personal goal, was nothing less than to propose a different theory of evolution, as opposed to the, Darwin's theory of evolution of species. Bateson argued for a much wider understanding of evolution in relation to multiple levels of learning across entire ecosystems. And who knows, maybe in a hundred years, Darwin will be a side historical figure like Wallace and others today, one of the steps, and we'll be talking about Bateson's theory of evolution. I think I do think that's possible, actually, if there are still people talking about such things in a hundred years. Bateson was, was critical of, of science in general. As, as I said, he, he was alarmed at the way in which physics provided the paradigm for thinking about almost any other kind of science, not just other hard sciences, but even in the social sciences, as I mentioned earlier in Freud. And much of this resonates with thinking today where it's increasingly clear that not only is physics a bad paradigm for sociology or, or biology or ecology, but physics isn't even a good paradigm for physics. And actually ecology and biology increasingly are used as, as actually something more like the kind of process metaphors that, that are needed for, for thinking even about um, well certainly quantum theory and relativity so Bateson presents serious critiques of all of the, the these thinkers Freud Marx and Darwin in particular and their followers and that and that you know makes it difficult for him to to position him within mainstream intellectual history it also made quite a lot of enemies made him sidelined in all kinds of ways but he did also I think offer a framework for a synthesis of all of these thinkers as well, or for ways of, of, of continuing working forwards with them. And that's one of the, I think, pieces of unfinished work that he leaves us with. And I do think that beyond historiographic interest of what is certainly a colorful and historical, um, uh, idiosyncratic historical character, there is a significant chunk of, of unfinished work that Bateson has left for us or that remains when we return to his, that emerges when, when we return to his work today. For me in particular, um, there's formal questions that emerge um, in his work, particularly when we, that there's a certain sense that, that a lot of the kind of ecological feminist thinking of Donna Haraway and Anna Singh and Karen Barad, they were all actually based, uh, or they are you know, these days based in the, in the history of consciousness program that he helped to set up. And in many ways, I mean, Haraway actually in particular, I found a text the other day where she, where, she talks about how Bateson uh, was foundational for her and, and one of the reasons she moved to the history of consciousness program. But within that um, feminist ec ecological thinking, there has been a return to matter and, and seeing matter as alive and organized, but often stops at certain metaphors of entangled or complex or muddled or so on, telling us that we should not panic and engage with these things. This is this is a step forward. But then now again, reading Bateson, having them having made that step after that, I think there's now ongoing formal work and actually understanding. Well, what do we mean by entangled? And, and Bateson gives us a, a, a moments of rigorous structures that can actually once again help with that. I think beyond that, Bateson forces us to think about our ability to plan and design anything. Actually, Bateson argues that we lack a theory of action regarding how to plan, design, or engage with complex socio-ecological systems. Indeed, for, for Bateson, design is almost the paradigmatic example, we might argue, of a practice emerging from the deeper epistemological era of Western thought that separates out you know, intellectual labor from manual labor and, and so on and so forth, and which results in violence to wider eco-mental systems. But if that's the case, then how should we then, as designers and architects and so on, proceed? Well, there are all kinds of interesting routes out of this double bind, potentially. Retreat is not possible. We need to stay with the trouble, to borrow from Donna Haraway, who, as I said, is, is very much within a, a slightly understated uh, legacy of Bateson. And we should also remember that for Bateson, double binds are also a route to radical systemic creativity. Some of the 
like Marx, the the the, the you know the nature of the Aufhebung in in you know, Hegelian Marxian dialectics is very similar, actually, to, to Batesonian double binds. When, when contradictions seem at their most terminal, what we actually need to do is shift to a to a different level of of, of thinking about this relationship. In this paper here, my primary goal, so if I've you know, given some re wider understandings of a return to base, and in this paper here, my primary goal is to make a small contribution to these questions, which I think do have implications for how we think about architecture and planning and design, and especially when working with ecological and biological systems and agents. I want to do that by rereading some moments from what we might call Bateson's three ecologies period which roughly spans from 1967 to 1972. This is an important period in the consolidation of his thinking and his orienting towards the emerging environmental movement, a period when, as his daughter Mary Catherine Bateson only half joked, he decided to start caring again. Working on this material in recent years, I've come to realize that there are two very different paradigms thinking about the total planetary ecology, as it were, in Bateson's work. And I refer to them here as the three ecologies, obviously a term which was picked up and we will see big into this in a moment in, in Guattari's work, but the three ecologies in Bateson, which are the self, the social, and the environmental, and one calling the two ecologies, which are the bioenergetic and the semiotic. And this paper will attempt to unpack those questions. Okay. Without doubt, the quote that I've turned to most often in recent years and which somehow has been most appreciated if, if in, in classes, this is the quote that everyone suddenly gets their phones out and starts taking photographs. When introducing the, the thought of the ecological anthropologist, Gregory Bateson, is this reference to the polluted Lake Erie, which we find in his pathologies of epistemology, and so it's great to know that this talk is, amongst other places, being delivered in the Great Lakes area. And we can read through it. I'm sure some of you can practically sing along. He states, you decide that you want to get rid of the byproducts of human life and that Lake Erie will be a good place to put them. You forget that the eco-mental system called Lake Erie is a part of your wider eco-mental system and that if Lake Erie is driven insane, its insanity is incorporated into the larger system of your thought and experience. Now, this was written at a time that's an image in the background of a, a algae bloomed Lake Erie that, 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 that was, you know, on the on the edge of collapse at the time that Bateson was writing this in 1969. And in fact, but this paper was given, it wasn't given to designers, it wasn't given to ecologists or um, any of that kind of crowd that Bateson was starting to talk to. This was actually delivered to therapists, to the mental health community. It was first given a, a second conference of mental health in Asia and the Pacific in Hawaii in 1969. Bateson was working there at the time, had some role in it. It was later much more widely disseminated through its inclusion in section six, the crisis in the ecology of mind, the Bateson's seminal first collection of essays, Steps to an Ecology of Mind published in 72. And I'll, I'll return to dig into this quote of various points through this paper. Now, in this paper, the pathologies of epistemology, and in a series of other notable interventions in this period, starting, I think, most significantly, and uh, I concur with uh, Anthony Chani um, on this, is uh, the importance of the 1967 um, presentation of a paper originally called Consciousness versus Nature at the Dialectics of Liberation Congress. And in this and in the in, in the three ecologies period, the five five years or so, the collection of seven or so papers that I'm focusing on here, Bateson sets out a conception of eco-mental systems as an alternative modern cosmology of mind which might be able to exist less violently within our more than human world ecology, a world ecology which can never be controlled or even fully understood. He was offering an alternative cosmology, which might even heal the trauma of several, several centuries of pathological violence 
inflicted by the broken thinking of Western cultures, now amplified across planetary ecologies by capitalism and its technologies themselves facilitated and helped into emergence through the very same broken thinking. In this, in this cosmology, Bateson offers us, in this cosmology that Bateson offers us, we find a description of mental processes unfolding in and through every sufficiently complex material system. That is to say, imminent within the organizational forms, dynamics, interactions, and patterns of energetic material systems. And in particular, in those energetic material systems, which have such levels of complexity, interiority, and so on, that we describe them as living and need to use some kind of semiotics to understand. And it's worth noting, ah, slide I was looking for a moment ago. Um, and it's worth noting in passing that Bateson was also a part of the group that emerged out of the kind of nexus of three interesting institutions very active in this period. The SLN Institute, Naropa and Lindisfarne, two of them in, in, on the west coast of the states, Lindisfarne up in Canada, um, run by William Thompson. Um, and the, the various Mind in Life uh, initiatives and dialogues that emerged, Francisco Varela and, and Bateson were, were crossing paths repeatedly at, at Naropa, Esalen and, and Lindisfarne. Um, and it's, and it's uh, Varela, obviously in particular, who, who initiated um, these dialogues. And again, actually, my double meaning will probably speak to this better than I can. Um, but when we look at, for example, this quote um, from his 1970 paper, Form, Substance and Difference, we can imagine that Bateson surely would have been at Dara Masala had he survived another decade. This from Form, Substance and Difference, he notes, the individual mind is imminent, but not only in the body. It's imminent also in the pathways and messages outside of the body. That's to say, you know, it's, it's not a spirit that's injected in by, you know, some God or existing on some other plane. It comes, it emerges out of the body. And the messages and pathways and messages outside of the body even. And there's a larger mind of which the individual mind is only a subsystem. This larger mind is comparable to God and is perhaps what some people mean by God but it's still imminent in the total interconnected social system and planetary ecology. So we're seeing here, we're, we're seeing both someone going into territories that, that well, as this later book described, yeah, angels fear to tread as it were, intellectuals normally fear to tread, um, but coming out with an entirely, if you like, mind in life or even God in life um, uh, uh, foundation for, for his thinking. What we also see here is one instance of the series of iterations of the three ecologies. Um, so we've got the individual mind, the, um, uh, and, the, and the, the social system, and then the planetary ecology. And, and so this is you know, just one of the, of the series of iterations of formulating three ecologies that he was going through at this time. If we go back to the presentation that he gives at the Roundhouse in 67, um, he gives a more unpacked version of this. He states, this conference fundamentally, and this is a conference, just jump back a couple of slides that you can just about see there, to demystify in, in the posters it's saying here, to demystify human violence in all its forms, the social systems from which it emanates, and to explore new forms of action. And as you can see, actually, the, 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 the program given to the conference by David Cooper and, and the anti-psychiatry um, theorist Ronnie Lang very much coincides with, with um, Bateson's emerging agenda at this time. And so it's within this context he presents. So it's at this conference, fundamentally, we deal with three enormously complex systems or arrangements of conservative loops. One is the human individual, its physiology and neurology conserve body temperature, blood chemistry, the length and shapes of organs during growth and embryology, and all the rest of the body's characteristics. This is a system which conserves descriptive statements about the human being, body or soul, psyche, uh, probably better read. For the same is true of the psychology of the individual where learning occurs to conserve the opinions and components of the status quo. 
very much a theme of, of that event. Second, we deal with the society in which that individual lives. And that society is again a system of the same general type. And third, we deal with the ecosystem, the natural biological surroundings of these human animals. Now, in these texts, Bateson repeatedly emphasizes the extended character of mental processes in general, and in particular, the mis-self-apprehension of the modern Western subject. Specifically, he's concerned with what we might call a double bind of consciousness, what he saw as the contradiction between that part of our cognitive process that has self-consciousness and what he calls conscious purpose, that set of cognitive processes which are able to focus on particular parts of their relationships such that they can make plans and act on them and in so doing form an active sense of self. But this, but this part which in its modern form has become isolated from a wider awareness of his extended unconscious mind and body, which previously Bateson argues throughout these papers, it had been able to interact with, there had been an interaction between conscious purpose and the wider ecology of mind through things like myths, poetry, religion, religion not as literally true, but as a series of structures that, that uh, open the individual out into bigger questions, and aesthetics. Aesthetics is, is in, in our research project, we're, we're, we're still working around various definitions of aesthetics, let alone what ecological aesthetics might be. And Basin himself makes various stabs at, at defining these himself. One of his uh, definitions as aesthetics is simply as a more sophisticated form of religion, um, but as this process of uh, experiencing your relationship as a part within a bigger set of, of wholes. Now he goes on and he says, on the one hand, we have the systematic nature of the individual bit human being, the systematic nature of the culture in which he lives and the systematic nature of the biological ecological system around him. But on the other hand, the curious twist in the nature of the systemic nature of the individual man, whereby consciousness is almost of necessity blinded to the systemic nature of the man himself. Purposive consciousness, this is, Bateson's definition of this particular, um, uh, well, certainly what exists within conscious animals that have a particular kind of action, as we shall see later, uh, purpose of non just pulls out from the total mind, i.e. the complete ecosystem, sequences which do not have the loop structure, which is characteristic of the whole systemic structure. You know, you're just, you know, you're, you're focusing on one or two things at the moment. You're not, by definition, aware of everything you couldn't be and do the conscious purpose work of, of trying to focus on something and that so this this conscious purpose is in, you know, is is incredibly powerful it's, it's what allows us to to do things but by definition it doesn't have systemic awareness um and so yeah it doesn't have this the the characteristics of the whole systemic structure if you follow the common sense dictates of consciousness you become effectively greedy and unwise. And I use the term, this is Bateson, I use the term wisdom for recognition of and guidance by a knowledge of the total systemic creature. And he says, yeah, you can call these God if you will. Uh, Bateson develops this three ecologies model over a series of papers, as I've said, between 1967 and 1971. Uh, the opening paper, and I think in many ways the founding event for actually launching this series of, of problems of, that happen when you decide to care again, as, as Mary Catherine put it, and, and also need to start thinking about possibilities of action um, and the dilemma of doing that, that kind of, you know, almost any action seems cursed by our necessary short-sightedness. Um, so, yes, it starts off the conscious purpose versus nature at the dialectics of liberation. He then organizes a series of small closed symposia to explore these questions more, the effects of conscious purpose on human adaptation in 1968, and the position paper for that is in steps. Uh, and that gets written up by Mary Catherine Bateson as our own uh, metaphor. Then in 69, there's, there's a very interesting event that we spent some time in the archive looking at, and we're all, I think, or some of us are, are working 
on that in relation to a few of these questions around action now. Bateson thought that this was actually a, a failure, this event. There's the pathologies of epistemology of the same year, and I'm going to return to that shortly. Um, the form, substance, and difference paper, sometimes known as the map territory paper, it's where he discusses Kotubsky's map territory relations. And then his turn, the beginning, actually, which then goes beyond this period of, of a turn to actually engaging with, with planners in 1970. This is the position paper to um, five days of working with a group around the New York planning office. I know my colleague Simon Sadler's um, digging into this at the moment. And um, the, the seminal essay, The Cybernetics of Self in 71, pretty much wraps these up. I've included Gratali's three ecologies on the bottom just as, as, as a reference, and I'll, I'll be pulling those pulling back to those later. But first, when I read these texts today, I hear Bateson suggesting that we need to unlearn many of the practices and habits that have precluded or alienated our perception of the necessary reality of our extended ecological and social selves, or what Bateson, during this period at least, experimented with describing as the distribution of mind, which I think probably would have been a better title for mind and nature than mind and nature, but uh, such is history. Yes, we are autonomous beings, but we are imminent within bigger eco-mental and social systems. And our autonomy actually derives from, and it's certainly not in any fixed opposition to, for example, as in any absolute nature culture, dichotomy or dualism. So, so our, our autonomy actually derives from, and it's certainly not in any fixed opposition to, our very relationality within a wider ecology of mind of many, many others of all kinds. You know, we're autonomous, but we're autonomous derives from our interdependence with a wider web of life. Bateson argues that we should think about lakes, cities, and so on as ecological cognitive structures or even character structures, which we are both a part of, and which are also a part of us. And he suggested various models for observing, working with, and thinking about such extended eco-mental assemblages, including the aesthetic or epistemological framing of three interacting ecological systems. Importantly, this ecological decentering of human subjects within human social collectivities and the decentering of both of those within a never entirely comprehensible and knowable wider ecology of mind also allowed Bateson to propose a powerful thesis regarding human and ecological mental health, trauma and pathology in relationship to, in the earlier instance, Lake, Geary, Lake Erie and environmental pollution. And I think this is incredibly important that he presented um, this notion of eco-mental systems to the mental health community first, as, as I say, and I, th I think there's more work to be done on this. Uh, at the end of the Pathologies of Epistemology paper, Bateson states, last, there is the question of urgency. It is clear now to many people that there are many catastrophic dangers which have grown out of the occidental errors of epistemology, you know, problems in Western thinking. So problems in Western thinking, it says, of course, these range from the insecticides to pollution, to atomic fallout, to the possibility of melting the Antarctic ice cap. So this is, I mean, it's, 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 it was clear to him in 69, obviously, we all know probably many people that this is still not clear to. I mean, it is worth saying that, that you know, that his, his, he talked about global warming at, in 67 at the Roundhouse event. And via it was actually via in particular barry commoner uh barry commoner um a slightly maverick environmental marxist thinker that that um he and actually mary catherine i think um that that was keeping up up to speed somewhat on on the latest thinking like the emerging environmental thing but but he was he was fully able to um yeah, the, the, in, in the archive, we actually saw a sort of extended correspondence where he was checking that he was right about these things uh, with various. Uh, so anyway, sorry. So he says, up to the Antarctic ice cap. He then goes on. I believe that this massive aggregation of threats to man and his and, and his ecological systems arises out of errors in our habits of thought, 
at deep and partly unconscious levels. And then the extraordinary statement really, as therapists, clearly we have a duty. You know, we can, because, you know, I mean, he's not, he's very much not saying as, as, you know, designers or architects or politicians or even social movements. It's a kind of extraordinary claim where a, he's identifying as a therapist here. Um, and as, as you know, we've been not time in this talk to run through it. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the range of disciplines that he did move through. But it's a kind of extraordinary claim, you know, um, but which I think somehow <laughs> resonates still in all kinds of interesting ways that actually, you know, the, the, the call that he's making here is for a certain kind of ecological therapy. And maybe that's actually a good paradigm for thinking about this. Okay, well, let's, let's look more. Because it seems to me that one therapist, perhaps the only one, but one therapist who most certainly did hear, feel, and was bold enough to take up Bateson's challenge to organize their work around nothing less than the underlying pathologies of Western thought, politics, and culture as a new practice of ecosophical, ecosophical therapy was Felix Guattari. I don't know why I always use this image of him, but it just makes me laugh at this point. 20 years after Bateson made the call for ecological therapy, Guattari pointed his readers back to the very same paper, in fact, the very same paragraph that I opened with today, the Lake Erie quote. At the beginning of his significant text, The Three Ecologies, where he quotes from Bateson, just after the quote we had, there's an ecology of bad ideas, just as there's an ecology of weeds. And maybe we can reflect further on what that might mean later in, in its various metaphors. Now, in this text, Guattari goes on to call, in terms that are highly resonant with Bateson's thinking, calls for um, an ethico-political articulation, which I call ecosophy, between the three ecological registers, the environment, social relations, and human subjectivity. I mean, absolutely. I mean, so, so Guattari never, Bateson never called these things the three ecologies. He kept just, it, this formulation kept reappearing. Guattari doesn't literally say in a sentence, I take this from Bateson, but repeat, but points us to Bateson at the beginning of the essay. And, and it's, as I say, it's super clear that, that it's coming from there. Um, and clearly, yeah, so clearly Guattari is taking Bateson's sketch of three ecologies quite directly, and in places more or less paraphrases Bateson directly, as well as taking on Bateson's individual social and environmental schema, Guattari also takes on Bateson's separation of the self from the individual. So Guattari affirmatively notes of Bateson further on in the essay. Gregory Bateson has clearly shown that what he calls the ecology of ideas cannot be contained within the domain of the psychology of the individual, but organizes itself into systems or minds, the boundaries of which no longer coincide with the participant individuals. Um, and he goes on, sorry, this would lead us necessarily to re-examine the relationship between the concepts of the individual and subjectivity, and above all, to make a clear distinction between the two. Vectors of subjectification do not necessarily pass through the individual, interiority establishes itself at the crossroads of multiple components. And we might go back, if you like, yeah, to the original in some sense, this Bateson, actually in a much earlier double bind paper, uh, which would have been Guattari's presumably first uh, meeting with, with Bateson's thinking, Guattari obviously be, having been part of the seminal pair of philosophers uh, working with Gilles Deleuze, to produce the capitalism and schizophrenia project, the um, anti-Oedipus and a thousand plateaus. Um, and so, yeah, Bateson, you know, I mean, Guattari's practically had been paraphrasing statements like this from Bateson, you know, he says, you know, words, schizophrenia, death to learning, and the double bind cease to be matters of individual psychology and become part of the ecology of ideas in systems or minds whose boundaries no longer coincide with the skins of the participant individuals. But this is, an, I mean, this, this is in no means a, you know, uh, a pointing out of, of unmade references. I think the references are there, even if they've been largely missed by many Guattarian scholars. And Guattari does take on a job of developing Bateson's formulation of eco-mental systems 
into what uh, Guattari describes as, uh, as a particular conception of mental ecologies, which become central to his ecosophy project. But more interestingly, Guattari also continues where he sees a, 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 bait, a split with Bateson. He says, but I part company with Bateson when he treats action and enunciation as mere parts of an ecological subsystem called context. And he then goes on, I myself consider that, ex the, that existential taking on of context is always brought about by a praxis, which is established in the rupture of the systemic pretext. Katari goes on to make some other very interesting moves, which I'll come back to following this critique. But what he almost certainly would not have been aware of, as the work was still almost entirely unpublished before Guattari wrote this in 1989, was that even 20 years earlier, Bateson himself had articulated almost precisely the same question and critique of his own work and the same question around his work. And in the symposium in 1969 that I referred to earlier, uh, the moral and aesthetic structure of human adaptation, Bateson states, what is lacking is a theory of action within large complex systems where the active agent is himself part of and a product of the system. So this is really interesting. We've got both Guattari and Bateson agreeing that approaching a theory of action is a key piece of work to do. And in fact, actually, we can now read some of the moves that Guattari makes in parallel with Bateson as Guattari's attempts to do that. In fact, and then this is pointing out to work beyond this paper, but but I think I think the answer to is partly um, come from we actually need to distinguish different kinds of action. There's it's almost certain uh, Guattari gives a footnote uh, to a piece of Bateson's thinking that he was thinking of in particular when he was talking about Bateson treating action as part of an ecological subsystem, and. Uh, the, the kind of system that Bateson was looking at there was, was one that was, in, was an ecosystem involving um, uh, living, you know, a living ecosystem, but not one that had, you, it, it wasn't involving humans. It didn't have human pur you know, uh, purpose of consciousness going on. So, uh, and so I think actually the different things that the, the both of them are identifying, Bateson possibly even kind of more so in a sense, is there's a certain kind of description of action when there isn't self-consciousness or conscious purpose, so action within ecological systems um, that aren't governed by conscious purpose. There's then another task of taking on what happens, what's a theory of action when we're also making plans about our action based upon incomplete knowledge. The, the, you know, this is the fundamental kind of human condition that both of them are, are kind of concerned with in a certain sense. And today, actually, both, both for, on top of that, the task facing both Bates and Anguatari, but and indeed is still for us today, is actually even more complicated, which is to develop a theory of action for agents with conscious purpose that's in some way can be once again shaped by some wider ecological wisdom. But now where the wisdom that that would be based upon is, is imminent within now a highly damaged planetary ecology. So there's a whole series of questions yeah, of, of how, you know, is, is that wider wisdom even still available or have we basically damaged that as well? And it's this kind of sort of series of, of how to, uh, yeah, it's almost sort of a series of logical types of action, we might say. So, okay, so interesting, we've got Guattari and Bateson, both work with Guattari not knowing that this is also Bateson's question 20 years earlier, but Bateson doesn't publish this stuff in it. Some of it gets out when uh, Rodney Donaldson produces the Sacred Unity, the second collection, but that doesn't first come out until 91, which is interesting reason that recently been released. For those of you on that. Um, and, but we're in this you know, more, even more complicated situation now of, of, you know, on the one hand sort of saying, well, can we even get this wisdom back? But then hang on, is that wisdom even there anymore? You know, is, if we, learn how to read ecosystems again will we just find out the, how insane we've driven them um without doubt a, a condition unprecedented in the history of life on this planet as far as we know it's interesting not only that they both agree on the work to be done but just how much how affirmative guattari is of 
the three ecologies model that he takes from Bateson. So these are the closing lines from Guattari's three ecologies. And I, I've, I've got about five minutes to, to realize I'm running slightly slow. Um, and he's talking here about you know, the need for new social and aesthetic practices, new practices of the self. He talks about in a highly suggestive stage, but which once again is still, of course, organized around you know this this three ecologies of a nascent subjectivity, constantly mutating socius, and then the environment and the process of being reinvented. And he goes on to say, you know, in, in terms incredibly reminiscent of Bateson, how this is underpinned, needs to be underpinned by an ethico aesthetic, new ethico aesthetic discipline. whole bunch of stuff about the three ecologies there, establishing the relationship between like, Bateson and, and Guattari's work on those. So there's two ecologies. Let's return now to, to the Lake Erie opening quote. What does it even mean to talk about a lake as an eco-mental system, an eco-mental entity? Reading Bateson today, it's clear that what's at stake in this claim is a much bigger claim. Quite simply, that there exist all kinds of non-human and more than human ecological intelligences or eco-mental systems. These eco-mental systems not only include animals and plants, but they also exist as extended complex assemblages, complexes assemblages or hollow biomes, such as rivers, mountains, forests, lakes and cities. These ecological systems regulate themselves and interact using language-like responses to differences, i.e. signs, in their environments, and thus can be termed semi-ecological. Some of these eco-mental systems, such as us humans and most animals, as we surely agree by now, also have self-conscious minds, i.e. in some way recursively perceive their own perceiving, even if we are not all self-conscious in the same ways. However, many other eco-mental systems are unlikely to be self-conscious at all, and certainly do not produce the same kinds of self-consciousness that the human brain in a body, in a social environment, in a wider web of life produces, even though they still embody cognitive and semiotic processes. Thus, we can still legitimately be asked how forests or cities think, even if we don't necessarily believe that they are self-conscious. Now, significantly, these ecological intelligences are not always others to us. One of the claims made by extended mind theorists of various kinds is that we and other, anim and other minds are constantly extending ourselves into and co-incorporating each other's minds, bodies, and environments, worlds. Freud in analysis recognized that our conscious selves emerge out of a much bigger unconscious mind, which includes all of the non-conscious or not always conscious processes of our own brain and body system. But it seems to me, as Bateson argued, that we also need to turn Freudian thinking inside out. Many of our unconscious processes are not only outside of the brain, but they're even outside of the body, extending through both our semiotic and metabolic relations with each other and a wider web of life. As Bateson noted in Form, Substance and Difference, Freudian psychology expanded the concept of mind inward Freudian psychology expanded the concept of mind inward. To include the whole communicational system within the body, the autonomic, the habitual, and the vast range of unconscious processes. What I'm saying expands the mind outward, and both of these changes reduce the scope of the conscious self. A certain humility becomes. Uh, appropriate. I won't, uh, there was a play to make there with Deleuze and Guattari, but I won't make that now. Now we can, we can note in passing actually how this understanding of a double unconscious, i.e. both an interior Freudian one and an external extended distributed Batesonian unconscious with respect to our roles as, as architects and, and designers. 
Um, now, it goes without saying that Bateson's description of the lake as an Ikea mental system does not map at all well onto the dominant Western disciplinary traditions that might claim to know about lakes, geography, biology, hydrology, etc. Repeatedly, Bateson reminds us that there are two distinct kinds of ecological entity which come into view, depending upon if we take the still dominant quantitative bioenergetic approach to ecology or the still minor informational semiotic approach. I'll try to explain the difference between those two. The bioenergetic approach tends to measure quantities of matter and energy moving through a system, and it measures those quantities at the boundaries of the organisms or organizations that it observes. It thus sees an ecology of discrete, autopoetic bounded organisms in metabolic relationships with their environment. But there's another ecological view of the very same interacting underlying ecologies, which focuses instead on the relationships running transversely through and across organis organized assemblages of various kinds. We see the same underlying flows, but this time perceive their patterns of relation such that the autopoetic boundaries recede from view, and instead we foreground sympoetic boundaries or sympoetic networks of biosemiotic communication. Again, in the form, substance, and difference of 1970, Bateson most clearly notes ecology has two faces to it the bioenergetics, the economics of energy and materials within a coral reef, a redwood forest, or a city. And second, an economics of information, of entropy and negentropy, which I think today we would we talk most easily about as semiotic. These two do not fit together well, precisely because the units are differentially bounded in the two sorts of ecology. In bioenergetics, which is natural and appropriate to think of units bounded at the cell membrane or the skin or of units of conspecific individuals, these boundaries are then the frontiers of which measurements can be made to determine the additive, subtractive budget of energy for the given unit. In contrast, informational and entropic ecology deals with the budgeting of pathways and of probability. The resulting budgets are fractionating, not subtractive, and the boundaries must enclose, not cut, the relevant pathways. So what's Bateson getting at in, in setting out this description of two ecologies and what's the relationship between the two ecologies that he's distinguishing here and the three ecologies. Now this is, ecology, this is a question that's been preoccupying me a lot recently. The distinction of bioenergetic semiotic and semiotic ecologies reproduces a distinction that Bateson repeatedly makes in his work, sometimes referred to as creatura and pleroma. Pleroma being the bioenergetic more, it's not exactly the same thing, but, but it's, it's another thing. And it, and it repeats a uh, uh, distinction that, uh, or the, the need to be attentive to the important difference in logical relations between the world that is brought forth by the concepts and practices of Western science and physics in particular, where quantities of mass and energy are determinant, and the world that's described as an informational semiotic interaction which for Bateson is not simply the human social world, but all living systems. And I've been through, just gonna run on slow, so I was, I was reiterating some of the points that he made with, with Freud again, but we've largely done that. So Bateson's, Bateson's pointing out, um, if you like, the way in which, two ways in which ecology has tended to be done 99% of it has been done in the kind of quantitative way, but there is, and, and, and in recent years, more of the work of biosemiotics in particular has taken this, this very different other approach. Um, but, so there's a sense in which we can ask, you know, are we seeing the presentation of the two ecologies not as a solution for thinking ecologically that Bateson is necessarily recommending, but rather as an expression of a, the broken thinking of Western modernity which we need to at least start to see and then start to rebalance. Um, but even then, it's interesting to um, think about this in relationship to the three ecologies. And at this point, is it is useful to return once again to Guattari's kind of you know, going independently, but actually following the same route. And so one of the things that we find in Guattari's three ecologies, interestingly, is he kind of then runs 
something similar to a two ecologies um, critique of each of the three. And like Bateson suggests, well, it's actually on the, on the semiotic side of the field, um, that we need to do more work. So this coming out of, yeah, uh, a, a sort of series of semiotic projects within the three ecologies, as it were. So it's, it's almost as if we actually end up with six ecologies, if you like, because there's a bioenergetic and semiotic component to each of the, the self, the socius, and the environmental. Um, but it's also a question of, I try to summarize because I'm running, running quite late. Um, it's also a question of, you know, we can, we can ask, okay, but in both of these cases, are the three ecologies or the two ecologies, are these being offered up as um, diagnosis of existing problematic ways of thinking, or are they being offered up as... Um, you know, as cures and ways to move forward. And actually, of course, it's, it's to some extent, it's, it's uh, we know from Bateson, it's, it's both like, like Guattari, indeed. Um, you know, he, he saw the symptoms actually as an attempt by the system to, um, to cure itself. There were a series of points that I wanted to make in conclusion, which I think I'm um, going to have to hold back because we can kind of wrap up there. But the, 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 I wanted to point out at least one other route uh, out of this that, that Bateson um, proposes. It, it's actually found in one of his nicest forms in the uh, presentation at the uh, Dialectics of Liberation uh, Congress. And it actually involves, if you like, a move to a different asking, what would, what should our modern cosmology be like? And he, and, and this is again, something we found in, in, in some letters to Mary Catherine in the archive. He, he repeatedly suggests that something like, uh, uh, you know, that leaving totemism was a, was a, uh, uh, a, a bad move. So, so what did he mean by totemism? describing cultural forms where human culture identified with or empathized with the natural world around them and took out took that empathy as a guide for our own social organization our own theories of our own psychology this is the anthropological term totemism now he says in a way it was all nonsense but it made more sense than what we do most of what we do today because the natural world around us really has this general systemic structure and therefore is an appropriate source of metaphor to enable man to understand himself and his social organization. He goes on to describe animism, which he says was still not such a bad idea in many ways. That's where the process works in the other direction, extending the post notion of personality out from ourselves onto mountains, rivers, forests, and such like. But it's the Western move, the, the, the move and exactly where you trace it to, but, but certainly the legacy that we're in, where we've separated notions of mind from the natural world, in which Bateson um, concludes in the end, you embark in the end, I believe, on a fundamental error, which in the end will surely hurt you. So it's, it's towards a new totemism was the, um, the concluding comment, but I really... I've taken up all of the time and I should stop there. John, thank you very much for your uh, thought provoking presentation. Um, really fascinating and uh, to see the connections you made between Bateson and Guattari and uh, between the three ecologies and the two ecologies. Uh, and, and for me, um, I, I was uh, really struck by kind of the the double bind and to stay in the trouble um, as as designers that uh, we shouldn't uh, kind of uh, forsake our professions, but maybe uh, to to take this um, as, as an invitation to to just critically re-examine um, the way in which we're designing. And um, I also really uh, like this idea of ecological therapy. Um, I think that's something that has a lot of generative capacity for us to, to, to think of ourselves as therapists. I know I have not 
really conceived my designing in that way, but it's a, it's a really interesting. Uh, and mm -hmm. then just at the end there, uh, kind of the return to, to totemism. I mean, uh, I ideas of biomimicry have kind of resurfaced in design, in regenerative design recently. Um, and I think we're starting to see that as well as with some of the re-indigenization and, and decolonialization of thinking that some of these ideas are starting to take root. So my, my question to you, and then I'll open up to questions from the audience, both in person and, uh, and on, online, is um, as, as an architect, um, how might you think of uh, forms of ecological therapy? What are some uh, examples that uh, might provoke people to think of their practice in in a in a different way. Yeah, I mean, okay, well, great. Thanks for for, for a series of points that you made there. Um, and yes, this isn't meant to be a stop doing design talk. This is partly rec recognizing that the dilemmas that we find ourselves in as designers are. are, are quite deep ones around the human condition and and that we yes that there are you know we all need to find a route out of that um in terms of yeah in, in terms of architecture and, and 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 moving forwards i think what one of the key things is recognizing that almost everything we do is going to be acting in in in, in kind of sort of ways that we won't entirely predict and so trying to build in processes of self-observation and actually taking um recognizing that quite small actions can you know have such profound effects that actually just trying to develop a new kind of totemism a new kind of empathy for the world around us which is now a damaged world it's also a technological world so it's 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 a kind of complex challenge of I think actually just gentle moves and observing, and interestingly, I wasn't expecting Grattari. So when when in preparation for this, I went back and was was rereading Grattari's three ecologies again, and I was actually surprised just how many calls for gentleness there are in there, um, which maybe isn't surprising. I mean, this is a practicing therapist. Um, but you often have a sort of slightly different impression of, of what they're calling for, and and but but I think you. Know, consistent in in something like this kind of approach is is yeah gentle and observe actually thank you very much um i'd like to ask if there are any questions here in the audience We're, we're having trouble with the roaming mic, so I'm just going to invite you to come up to the microphone to ask your question to John. <laughs> okay, there you go. Great. Hello. Um, thank Hi. you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering uh, if you have ever looked towards any Indigenous uh, ecologies or any sort of um, Indigenous ecological thinkers. I'm seeing, you know, I don't know much about Bates Bateson, uh, excuse me, but I'm seeing a lot of kind of continuances from some of the traditional uh, Indigenous ecologies that I've learned of. Yeah, yeah, no, great. Thank you for that question very much. So, I mean, there, there was a couple of hidden references in there to one. So when I was talking about, you know, how forests and cities think, I, I was, there was a kind of hidden reference to Eduardo Cohn within there, who's who's been an imp a very, I think, interesting thinker in this area. I mean, I mean, actually, a, a great amount of the anthropology that's come out of South America in particular in recent years, where there's been, if you like, a kind of bridging of these Guatarian and Batesonian worlds in, in you know, uh, Escobar, Pluriversal um, moves and, and, and the um, Eduardo Cohn, uh, uh, that whole body of, of work, I think, is, is something that we've been using a lot at the RCA, actually, on the Environmental Architecture Programme, where the nature of the, of, partly actually, is also a, a second part of an answer to, to the previous question as well. One of, one of the, on the Environmental Architecture Programme, the way in which that's organised there is, is actually in, into joining by invitation into environmental um, disputes of various kinds and often trying to 
put a, a certain environmental architectural skill set uh, to help mediate very different kinds of knowledge. And so, and so to give a couple of, of examples, we were working in, in Chile uh, with uh, communities in the Andes and around the Atacama Desert, helping them to engage in um, environmental disputes with lithium mining companies there. There was a second three-year research project in the in the forests of Borneo. And in both of those instances, that, that I mean, they, they were actually very practical lived experiences for us of actually working within at the interface of completely different cosmologies you know uh working with local testimony that was completely rigorous but based in very different kinds of of stories or ways of accounting um for an, an environment that was actually much more animistic actually there last year i mean they, 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 there's kinship relations for them with the environment in in, in very direct ways and 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 kind of interfacing that with, if you like, you know, legal documents and 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 so on that they might need for defending land claims and that kind of thing. So ab ab absolutely, I mean, both both as I say, in our own located teaching and research work. Um, but but you, you, in 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 all of those texts, you 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 do find Bates and footnoted um, in 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 all of the 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 South recent South American anthropological work. So. Um, yeah, no, he's still being read there as well, which is good. That is super interesting. We have time for one more question. Thank you so much for, for the talk as well. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask is uh, when it comes to the ecological systems that you mentioned, uh, you talk about interdependence, you talk about uh, the idea of human adaptation and the constant change of the systems. I wanted to ask you about the idea of uh, cycling of resources, where uh, the idea of the ecological systems, um, it, uh, in spite of the constant interdependence, the constant change, that the ecological systems themselves are uh, innately self-sustaining, and that uh, they are uh, self-supporting. Uh, oh, <laughs> hello. Uh, the the, the self-supporting, the idea that there are always resources that could be reused, could be constantly used, whatever they may be. It could be socialization among human beings. It could be uh, the communications or skills or knowledge that constantly. So from a design, uh, from a, a systems design perspective, do you see that as something that would be inherent in us thinking? That uh, the, the 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 resources can be constantly cycled. There's always something that can be used within the systems. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts? Okay, well, there's a, there's, there's a thank you for for raising a bunch of interesting points there. Actually, I don't to try and address some of them. So so in a, in a general sense, the the questions that you're raising. Um, which, which we can talk about as resource flows, we can talk about as, as metabolic flows uh, in various ways. And one of the interesting pieces of work that's come out of, um, in recent years, ecological thinking within the Marxian tradition has been looking very much at this concept in Marx of the metabolic rift, which, which essentially was kind of sort of in a, in a sense describing precisely the sort of epistemological error the playing out of the kind of epistemological errors that Bateson is talking about so for Marx you know the, the metabolic rift if you like is, is when, when you shift from people living in a territory where they're reproducing themselves in a given area and and as you, you know, as, as you kind of sort of described in, in, in those in those scenarios that there's a, a series of cycles of, of resource flows as, as you know most simply you know food is eaten produces you know human societies but the the, the waste re-enters the ground there and the, and the, and the metabolic rift and in, in, you know on, on 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 that model is when you get the kind of division of labor that that capitalism instantiates and, and the division of territories in a similar way, then you start getting a, a flow of nutrients moving from the countryside to the city and then from the city into the sea. And so you then have to start, you know, you're polluting the sea, you're depleting the countryside, you then need to start inventing artificial fertilizers and so on and so forth. And, and th th there's been some very interesting work in recent years done by people like um, Jason W. Moore, in particular, the capitalism in the web of life work and his work around the capitalocene. 
is, is, is super interesting. But one of the reasons why I raise this now is precisely because in, in the kind of sort of theory of colleges version, these are, are all kind of working within these are these are just bioenergetic descriptions. So these, these are, you know, the, when we think about metabolisms like that, we're, we're measuring quantities of things moving around and we can then understand when there's metabolic rifts happening and flows of, you know, waste happening at global scales and flows of resources happening at global scales and we're south to north and north to south regarding those two things. Um, but there's, but we're, if you like, still not seeing the, seeing them as if you like semiotically we're still we're, we're only quantifying them and but some but the 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 work of this ecological marxist crowd is actually on the edge of uh, a semiotic analysis which is essentially actually what marx kind of does anyway so 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 the um, one point i wanted to yeah just flag up to you is is actually there's some really interesting work being done in the ecological Marxian area, and one of the things I'm trying to do is think these two things together because it's because part of the reason for pulling out this three times two structure is to, is to enable some of that stuff to now be uh, fitted into this argument. Um, in terms of the bigger questions you're asking, I can actually refer you back to I mean, if, if you're interested to, to some earlier work that I did on a different research project around the question of scarcity. And there, there's an AD issue uh, on, on that theme that we edited around that. And, we, and which, you know, very much, I think, argues, if I understood correctly, the kind of point that you were making, which is that it's, it's you know, the, the, the metabolic rift so described by Marx is, 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 is not a natural or necessary or, or inevitable condition. And that actually, you know, it's, it's not that resources are running out at all, as it were. It's 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 actually the politics of scarcity that determines resource flows and reproduction and the cycles of loop, which are then subject to these uh, um, yeah damaged Western logics, which have now embedded themselves within our economic system. So, yeah, I, I hope, hope hopefully that's partial uh, answer to to some of the things that you, you guys were raising there. Thank you very much, John. Uh, really, really interesting. And uh, on behalf of everyone here in, in person, as well as the folks joining online, thank you very much for kicking off uh, this day of RSD. Okay, great. Well, have a great day. And we're now headed into a break and uh, we'll be starting up again at uh, 10.30. So see you all back for the panel. <laughs>
This one is the veal. Right. 